happy Saturday. Last week, we name-dropped French fashion designer Paul Poiret in our behind-the-scenes on Isadora Duncan. Holly talked about his designing clothes for her and her daughter, and I was kind of like, yeah, that makes total logical sense. (laughs) (laughs) It seemed like a good time based on that to pull our episode on Poiret out of the archive. Yeah, and this episode originally came out on June 11th, 2013. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I am Tracy V. Wilson. And today we're talking about one of my favorite designers of all time. Yes. Yes. Who is that? Paul Poiret. I thought it might be. Or if you really want to French it up, Paul Poiret. But I won't do the full pronunciation throughout the podcast because it starts to get a little clunky. Feels awkward. His famous quote from 1913 was, I am an artist, not a dressmaker. Like he, he's one of those people that when you study him, you wonder if he came off to people around him as super conceited and blustery. Yeah, I was going to say that doesn't sound pretentious at all. But he also was a really hard worker and he really did innovate. So maybe his confidence was just all built off of knowing that he was going to plow through and... Yeah, some actual success and not just grandiose statements. Yeah, and indeed, I mean, his work, which was often very avant-garde for the times, changed the fashion world in really significant ways. And people may not know his name unless they're really into historical fashion, but odds are you would recognize his designs. Um, You know, his silhouettes tend to be very long and narrow skirts, sometimes pants topped off with these very dramatic tunics that tended to be uh, wider So the top portion of the silhouette tended to be wider than the bottom. Um, And they were really the height of fashion in the 19 teens, in the early, heading into the early 1920s. A lot of his his designs are actually done by other artists at the time. He collaborated with a lot of them. So if you look at drawings by Erte, a lot of those are him. Uh, Erib, who he worked with and we'll talk about briefly. Uh, Those drawings that are sort of famous and they're like just pre-flapper era People recognize, but they may not realize that a lot of those are Paul Poiret. And even the ones that aren't are often influenced by the things that he was doing in fashion. So he was born in 1879 in Les His father was a cloth merchant, so he got a lot of exposure to fashion in his early life uh, while his family was working class. Yeah, and his father sent him at a very early age to apprentice with an umbrella maker because as a working class family, they wanted him to have a skill. Uh, But young Paul would actually gather the small scraps left over at the end of the day, the little pieces of silk left over from the umbrella cuttings, and he would make clothes for his sister's dolls. So he was doing fashion in small scale pretty early in his life. And that's a pretty perfect use for umbrella scraps. Yeah. In 1898, his fashion career officially started. Couturier Madeleine Chary bought 12 of his designs. And shortly thereafter, Poiret was hired by couturier Jacques Doucet as a junior assistant, and he quickly worked his way up to head of tailoring in that group. And he was so successful in his position that uh, he was eventually tapped by Doucet to take on jobs designing costumes for stage actresses. And he made a really big name for himself doing this. Um, there's one particular garment that's often referenced, which is a mantle he made for a play entitled Zaza, which was worn by actress Gabrielle Rejane. And it was black tulle layered over black taffeta, and it was painted with white irises. And it made a big splash, and it was... Um, allegedly very impactful in terms of the emotional moment of the scene in which it appeared. And Poiret sort of started to realize that he could actually be using the stage as a runway to showcase his own designs and build a following. So he kind of became famous for these garments he was making for actresses. It's kind of double a double-edged sword, though, because it's rumored that when he was working with celebrated actress Sarah Bernhardt, that he was overheard by the actress while he was making fun of her, and she had him fired. But that's, again, kind of a cloaked-in rumor part of history. Some histories of him will say that happened, some will not. Uh, Because at the same time, which was 1900, Poiret also had to report for military service, which was mandatory. So it's entirely possible that the Bernhardt story is just gossip that took advantage of that timing. 
Regardless of how he left the job, Doucet had been really encouraging of his activity and his style, so it was pretty tragic that he left the the world for a while. Yeah, I mean, uh, any creative type that gets a lot of encouragement, that's like a perfect situation. So to unfortunately step out of that is not ideal. But he only had to do his year of mandatory service. And when he returned to Paris in 1901, he was hired almost immediately by the House of Worth. And that was one of the most prominent design houses in Europe. Um, If you look at fashion plates of the Victorian and Edwardian eras, many of them, many of the styles and fashions will be credited to House of Worth. I mean, they were huge. Uh, And at the time Poiret was hired into the firm, Charles Frederick Worth, who had founded the fashion house, had already passed away. And his two sons, Jean-Philippe and Gaston, had taken over. Unlike his time working under Doucet, he didn't get a lot of encouragement at Worth. Instead of taking advantage of all this theatricality and dramatic style that he had really cultivated, the brothers Worth put him to work on pretty mundane stuff. He tried to inject his style into what he was doing, but that was not really what the Worth clientele were looking for. They were used to getting stylish clothing that was guaranteed to be seen as stylish and not just experimental stuff. They were not ready for the avant-garde. No. The good thing, though, is that he did have an incredible confidence. Uh, Even through the rough times at House of Worth, he was certain that he was going to move on to better things. And even when clients were complaining that he was making ugly, crazy clothes, he was really unflappable about it, which is pretty impressive and astonishing. Uh, And in 1903, he finally took his future into his own hands and he opened his own shop. And because Paré had charmed many clients, uh, he actually had a great many fans in high places. The King of Portugal allegedly sent two white mules to the designer for the opening of his boutique in Rua Aubert. And they stood outside on opening day, like the doors were just flanked by these two mules, just kind of wonderfully odd and perfectly theatrical. To grab attention. Uh His designs in 1903 broke with a major fashion rule by ditching petticoats entirely. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. We think of it today and it seems like, well... You yeah. don't need a petticoat, but you did then. Yeah. Well, and that's that. This was if you were out without a petticoat, it, it wasn't just that your clothing didn't look right. You were being immodest and indecent without petticoats on. Yeah. Uh, so he carried on for a couple of years in his new shop. And in 1905, Paré married his wife, Denise. And the pair had really known each other since childhood. Uh, She was not exactly known to be like a great beauty. She had really been kind of a simple girl from simple beginnings because remember his childhood started in very simple places. Uh, But through her marriage with Paul, she really became something of a style icon and she served as his muse uh, and she would wear his fashions as the pair toured Europe and eventually other places together. Um, And they had five daughters together throughout their marriage. And later in life, uh, Paul would say, sort of unkindly of Denise, she was extremely simple, and all those who have admired her since I made her my wife would certainly not have chosen her in the state in which I found her. That makes me angry. It's a little snarky, but things did not... They did not uh, stay rosy with the two of them forever. No, but for a while she was his muse, and I think she became the style director of his design house for a while. And, and you know, he really clearly loved the female form and loved to dress it and wanted to free it from a lot of the things that um, people were kind of wadded up in terms of the rules of clothing. Yeah, there were lots and lots of layers. <laughs> and Denise was a huge part in kind of that movement towards a, a freer mode of dress. In 1906, Poiré produced an album of fashion designs. It was illustrated by Paul Irib, called simply Les Robes de Paul Poiré. At this point in his career, Grecian clothing and Japanese kimonos and certain kaftan styles from Middle Eastern and North African cultures were really influential in Poiré's designs. He wanted to make garments that used simple rectangles instead of really complicated shapes. He developed lots of designs that celebrated the so-called Directoire Revival silhouette. So very columnar. And 1906 was also the year that he did something, again, controversial when he replaced the corset as a foundation garment for his designs with a much less restrictive girdle. And this is a huge deal. Um, 
this is like akin to women burning their bras in the 60s, except it was a man doing it for fashion. Well, and it really happened. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, in terms of like the cultural touchstones that people think of. Right. This is really big to basically say the undergarments are stupid and wrong. Let's get rid of those. We're going for a more natural shape. Um, No petticoats, no corsets. Complete mayhem, really, in terms of uh, what had gone before. Yeah, and the, again, it, it wasn't just about what the clothes looked like. It was a, about all these ideas of modesty that were tied to it and, yeah. and decency and, like, what what good ladies of quality wore when they were going out. And he threw those out the window. Yep. And he wasn't the only designer, we should say, doing these things. Uh, like, V&A was doing similar stuff. Um, but he was kind of so outspoken about it, and he had such a flair for the dramatic that he got the most attention in the press and societally for what he was doing. But when you mention the modesty issue, that brings us to a scandal that took place. Yes, there was a scandal in 1909 involving uh, Poiret and British Prime Minister H.H. H. Asquith and his wife. The story goes that Lady Asquith was a fan of Poiret's work and invited him to show his designs at 10 Downing Street. As is sometimes the case with fashion shows, things got a little bit out of hand. Rumors started to spread of really wild happenings and models running around the famed residence in various states of undress. The scandal really nearly caused Asquith's resignation, and it came to be known as the Downing Street scandal. And then... uh... Once that blew over and we move forward a little bit to 1911, we really hit what is, in the history of Paul Poirier, a huge, huge year. First, he did something that had never been done before, which is that he expanded his brand. And that's not something we normally attribute to things that were going on in the early 1900s, like the idea of a fashion designer having a brand. Uh, And he produced a fragrance line that was named after his daughter, Rosine, and it was really successful, and it eventually became fragrances and cosmetics and continued to sell very, very well. He also opened a decorative arts school for underprivileged girls, which was called École Martine, and that was named after another of his daughters. He used the artwork the girls produced to create fabric prints, which they sold in a shop adjacent to the school. This really delights me. Yeah. I feel like it was the spoon flower of the... (laughs) Kind of. And it really ended up becoming like a lifestyle brand at that point because it also... uh, They also sold things like stationery and you know, small little house items there that had often used the designs of these girls. And so his sort of home uh, line became known as the Martine Group after uh, this school and the um, the attached store, which is really cool. Uh, and then he invented around in 1911 what was called the Robe de Minute. And this is, again, one of those things that is so simple, but really mind-blowing for the time. It was basically a simple column of silk cut almost like a t-shirt, and it allegedly took only 30 minutes to assemble. So compared to the structured Edwardian fashions that were still pretty prominent at the time, this was basically like walking around in a nightgown. So to show up at an evening party in this, which was usually what his wife did, she was like wearing his really kind of cutting edge designs before anyone else did, which is why she became a fashion icon, really was pretty brazen and took a lot of bravado. And it was... um, Ultra revolutionary, but again, we should point out that it's not on its own. He's not the only one doing these sorts of things. This is also around the time that Italian designer Mariano Fortuny was producing his really ultra simple Grecian style silhouettes that took advantage of his secret and famous silk pleating techniques. So there was this um, aesthetic developing in fashion circles for simpler but really beautiful garments um, in this Grecian columnar style. Yeah. And if you're not really familiar with with what Edwardian fashions look like, we can just they were very fitted. And think of Titanic. Yeah, think of Titanic. Very fitted. Many layers of underpinnings underneath. That there's just a lot going on. Fussy. And, yeah. Fussy's a great word. Like yeah. you you really had to have help to get into your clothes and not so much the case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though the lines were simpler, I think people think of Edwardian clothing as being simpler because it's the next phase after Victorian, which was very fussy and everything had a bazillion tassels on it. Um, the clothing got, the lines got simpler and sharper, but and there wasn't as much crazy embellishment, but all those layers were still there. Mm-hmm. So you still had on your uh, bloomers or your pantaloons and a chemise and a corset and possibly a corset cover and then a gown, possibly an undergown, a 
you know, petticoat. I mean, all of, and he basically got rid of all of that and said, just wear a simple silk sheath. It's fine. I mean, <laughs> and everybody was like, what? That's bold. You want me to do what? <laughs> He was sparked by an interest in exoticism after traveling to Moscow in 1911. This was a huge influence on his work from this point. Shortly after he came back to Paris on June 24th, 1911, he hosted the historically famous party called The Thousand and Second Night. There was allegedly a new translation of The Thousand and One Nights making the round in Paris at the time, uh, although we haven't really been able to confirm that in time for this episode. Guests were required to attend in Persian-styled clothing, or they had to be, uh, they had to allow the host to dress them once they got there. Uh, this was actually a ploy on Poiret's part. He was dressing his guests in his new line of designs that were inspired by his travels, um, specifically a production of Scheherazade he saw at the Ballet Russe, and his newfound interest in Orientalism. And it's it's really sort of where I think a, this party and this line of clothing is is really where his style kind of gets put under the magnifying glass in terms of the future. Like that's what a lot of people associate with him mm-hmm. or the, is that line of clothing. And that's actually where he debuted the harem pants that he became famous for and the lampshade dresses that he is also known for today. The lampshade dresses really, when you say that, I think sometimes people that might not know have a hard time picturing it. They really were these tunic style dresses that had wire in the hem to pull them out from the body so it looked like a lampshade. Um, And these less confining shapes actually became incredibly popular and they kept Poiré very busy filling client orders, even though they were completely crazy and way beyond what had been going on in fashion previously. People just really jumped on it. They loved it. Well, if you had a chance not to be in a corset with all those layers of heavy clothing. Yeah, because we've we've talked a lot before about how what people think of as as corsets, often not how they were actually worn. Right. It was not really a tight lacing thing that we think of today, but it was still a lot of clothing. All that (laughs) stuff that you're wearing is really heavy. Yeah. And and once you get out of all of that and realize that you can walk around your life without 25 pounds of fabric hanging off of your body, it's pretty liberating. Well, and it's also worth mentioning, I think, that this was all happening in the summer. Uh-huh. So, like, the idea of suddenly being free of all of that extra clothing in the hottest time of the year, uh, which it would have been for Europe at the time, um, that's got to be pretty appealing. And I'm sure that factored into the... Um, Sort the success, of the quick mm-hmm. acceptance of these very new styles. In 1913, Poiret and Denise traveled to the United States, where they were received with great delight by the fashion crowd. He gave a series of lectures in Manhattan, and the two of them toured department stores and showed off all the latest designs from their collection. Uh, It's interesting to know, I was looking at something while I was prepping for this that said that he found um, American women too thin and not very fashionable, but they seemed so eager. He was fine with it. He was, we can work with this. Uh, Also in 1913, he turned once again to his roots in the theater. And most notably, he designed costumes for Jacques Richepin's uh, La Minarette. And he once again saw the opportunity to use the stage as a runway, and he put his lampshade tunics front and center. So even though it had been a couple years at that point, those were still very popular, and he was still pushing them. Uh, And, you know, doing very, very well as a, um, a theatrical designer. But then 1914 changed everything for the House of Poiret. He had come to be known as Le Magnifique for his innovative and original creations, but World War I saw him once again called into military service, this time as a military tailor, and he's said to have streamlined the production of uniforms during that time. But because he was busy with his service and wasn't producing any new designs, his fashion house was using the handful of ideas that he had left behind when he went back to the Army, so they were kind of just recycling this handful of concepts that he had to try to push out new stuff, but they really, without him at the helm, it's a bit of a struggle. In 1915, while he was still serving, he was able to return to Paris for a little bit of time to design a new collection. But two tragedies struck his family right at the same time. His daughter Rosine died after contracting an ear infection, and his daughter Gaspard died from the Spanish flu. The new collection didn't happen because of these two events. No new designs came from the Poiré brand until after the war was over. 
This was really a turning point in Poiré's life, although it wasn't apparent how much impact it had until later. So once he returned to his work in fashion after the war in 1919, he picked up exactly where he left off, designing these high-waisted gowns that were inspired by other cultures and that featured a lot of dramatic detail. He continued to produce his same style of design, but because his aesthetic seemed to have really frozen at the period right before he left to serve in World War I, his look was too outdated. Coco Chanel had arrived on the scene with her little black dress in 1925, and the overworked theatricality of Poiré's designs was immediately seen as old-fashioned and out of mode. So that same year that Chanel debuted the little black dress, 1925, Poiré, who was desperate at that point to save his fashion house, sold the rights to his company to financial backers. He still worked there, but he didn't own it. And his design really struggled. Uh, He continued to attempt to innovate, but it seemed like he didn't have the inspiration. So it was very forced. Uh, And his design, when people describe his designs at the time, they sound like they're kind of overworked and a little bit lacking. Uh, And in an effort to rekindle public interest in his work, because he wasn't bringing in customers, he staged this huge spectacle of three decorated barges on the banks of the Seine for an arts decoratifs exhibit. And, you know, it was this huge big event for part of his houseware line. But because his theatricality, which served him really well in times of plenty, it nearly bankrupted him in this period when he didn't have that much ready money. And it was, you know, a, po- a period of struggle for the designer. So he couldn't pull off those same big crazy things that he had been doing before because it was too expensive and people weren't into what he was doing anymore. No, especially once you get into the, the 20s and the 30s, people were not about extravagance anymore. Ooh. So this is really a a downward turn. And then after 23 years of marriage, Denise Poiré filed for divorce in 1928, uh, claiming that he was just relentlessly cruel to her. And the following year in 1929, the backers who had bought the Poiré design house just four years before closed the shop's doors. They had already had it with the spending and they knew that they couldn't sustain the business. And they sold off every asset as scrap which is sort of heartbreaking. Uh, Like it was literally sold by weight. Super sad. It's really upsetting. Um, But we didn't lose everything. Uh, Poiré was also unfortunately forced to sell most of his personal assets. So the furniture and paintings that he had had in his townhouse at that time were sold off and he had to move to a much smaller apartment. At this point, he turned to writing for a couple of years. He published On Dressing This Age in 1930 and his autobiography King of Fashion in 1931. The publications didn't get him back on his feet, and by 1933, he was designing dresses in department stores for housewives. Yeah, quite a step back from what he had been doing. And uh, by 1936, he was discovered working in a bar, but people that talked to him found him as confident as ever. He really thought he was going to make a comeback in fashion. Paul Poiret died in 1944 in poverty. He'd been living on public assistance, and Elsa Schiparelli, who he had befriended and encouraged when she was young and starting out, paid for his burial. And so even though it seems that he has a sad ending, it kind of turns around later after he's gone for a bit. Uh, In May of 2005, Denise's wardrobe, which it turned out had actually been carefully preserved by the family, so thank goodness it was not sold off in that bulk Um, clear out that the backers had done, was auctioned off. And when this happened, it suddenly put Poiré's designs back in the public eye. And so even though he had been marginalized at the end of his life, the interest in his work was like instantly reignited. People saw these designs and it was like, how did we ever forget this person? Like, how did we let this fall into obscurity? Then in 2007, the exhibit Poiré King of Fashion opened at the Met to great fanfare and praise. Uh, And while Poiré is long gone, his impact on fashion still remains. He was, of course, the first couturier that used draping rather than tailoring to create gowns, Uh, you know, freeing the women from restrictive corsets that had been de rigueur up to that point. And in fact, you know, in getting rid of all of those fussy layers, he just completely changed fashion forever. Like now, you know, of course, garments are draped. And, you know, if you watch Project Runway, you see people that do a lot of draping techniques to create these really flowing, beautiful gowns. That's still happening. And he was the first that really did it commercially. He's also the person that debuted the idea of nude stockings instead of black tights. 
Yeah, which is quite revolutionary. And now, now we have options for both, but at the time it was black tights or nothing. Both are neither. <laughs> both are neither. Yeah. We're just not having hosiery. And he, as I said, was the first designer who really had a brand. So fragrance, home design, lifestyle products. He was doing this in the early 1900s. Like what Ralph Lauren does today would never have happened without this kind of idea sparking. And fashion marketing was also something that he really pioneered. He was a person that was out there doing his own PR, telling people how great he was, promoting his brand, which no fashion houses were doing that way at the time. Some have said that we would not have the avant-garde designers of today if there had been no Poiret. Imagine a world without Jean-Paul, Jean-Paul Gaultier. I think you don't want us to do that. I wouldn't. I would cry. I love Gaultier. <laughs> and pants. Yes. For ladies. Yes. Um, yeah, that wasn't really happening prior to that. There were some sporting costumes in late Victorian and early Edwardian era, but it usually involved bloomers that were cut a little more like pants under a full dress <laughs> so you could do sporting things and not expose anything, but you still had on a kajillion layers and yards and yards and yards of fabric. Yes. So he just completely revolutionized the way we dress. Um, and it's sort of interesting because we think today of haute couture um, as being other. I think most people on the street don't think of that as being, you know, the thing that really influences their day-to-day fashion. Mm-hmm. But he was kind of doing this influencing, even though it was – in more couture circles, and it's echoed out, you know, since then. Yeah. It reminds me of Downton Abbey, and there's an episode in which uh, Lady Sybil comes to dinner. Yes. Pants. Yes. Paul Poiret. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love, I love his work. I highly encourage anybody to um, go Googling and looking for pictures of it because some of it's just mind-blowing. He also did do some really, really skinny skirts that were hard to walk in. Yeah. But we would forgive him of that. We were talking about that earlier, about how we have all of these getting rid of restrictive layers and getting rid of corsets and getting rid of all these things that bind people. and But then having these skirts that were so, so tight that you couldn't really walk in them. I have a theory uh-huh. that is unsubstantiated. I haven't done the research to prove or disprove it. But I wonder, because he was so influenced by Asian cultures, such as he knew them, um, And, you know, it's considered very um, much a part of, like, geisha culture to take the very tiniest steps. It's part of, like, the delicate and graceful way that geisha move and their shoes are actually designed to kind of promote this sort of movement. And I wonder if he was trying to mimic that a little bit in a more Western style. Maybe. But I don't know. I'm I'm – just speculating at that I point. I hate skirts like that because I am a tall lady. <laughs> I take very giant steps all you the do. time. You're a long strider. And uh, I, I have two skirts that I bought at the same time, not realizing when I tried them on that they were going to cause me not to be able to do that. I have never worn them since getting them home from the store. So for you, pants. Yep. Or things that don't have a hem that keeps me from walking. There you go. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 